Frank McPhee was born in Lennox Town on the 21st of October 1948. He was the only boy with five other siblings, all girls. Not much is known about his father, who was rarely home, as he had to go where he could find work. But Frank's mother was originally from a family of travellers. When Frank and his sisters would speak with their mother, they would speak in shelter, an old Irish traveller's language that only they could understand. His origin was to mislead outsiders who weren't part of the travelling community. They moved to Edinburgh when Frank was around 11 years old, for two years. Then the McPhees moved back to Glasgow's Rough Mary Hill housing scheme to settle down. Frank's mother had been travelling most of her life and thought it should be different for her own kids and they should be settled in one place. This is where Frank would make his notorious reputation. Frank quickly learned that Mary Hall was a bit different to the other places that he had stayed, but Frank liked it. He fell into the grips of petty crime on the hard streets. McPhee being the only boy in a house full of girls, he was getting into fights regularly, just sticking up for his sisters, but they could also stick up for themselves. As Frank got older, the crimes got more serious, and McPhee's crime of choice was armed robbery. He was also into pit bull terrier dogs and dog breeding, as well as illegal dog fighting. You see people involved in serious and organised crime breeding dogs regularly these days, but Frank had kennels out his back long before anyone had even thought of it. He was well ahead of his time when it came to that. His dogs were vicious and would fight alongside him on many occasions. In the mid-1970s, Frank had got himself involved with ice game vans, just like most serious players at the time. He was renting one with his then brother-in-law, Archie Steen. Steen's van was in the tough Castle Milk housing scheme, and Frank, like most, was caught up in the violence that came with it. Archie Steen was in jail for the gangland murder of John Stilly, along with associate Robert Brodie. Both men also attempted to murder William Toe Elliot by shooting him. The guy that was running the van for Steen was getting hassle off a more local van owner and it had to be sorted out, so Steen phoned Frank from Berlini to sort it. Allegedly guns were fired and the other ice cream van was smashed up. Frank's now infamous Iceman nickname came from this era in his life, not just for his association with ice cream vans, but for how cold and calculated he was when it came to carrying out acts of violence. In 1978, Frank was charged with firearms possession, apparently on the way to do another frightener for Steen of another ice cream van. This along with his part in a robbery of a local shop, he was sentenced to five years in prison. While in the Napa, aka Peterhead Nick, he met plenty of like-minded people, but in truth, he was a bit of a late bloomer. First time he'd really been caught for anything serious at then age 30. But that didn't slow McPhee down, in fact, he was making up for lost time and was willing to do anything to make quick money. He controlled the tobacco and drugs in Peterhead Jail. After his release from jail, he was then caught again for his part in another armed robbery of a post office. He was sentenced to another five years in jail in 1986. Frank was back out in the streets in early 1990 with yet more serious connections. He was really making his way up in Glasgow's underworld. The armed robberies were becoming too risky for Frank, even after he had walked free after sitting on remand for 110 days, charged for a northeast of Scotland £42,000 raid in 1990. The cash was never recovered. He had got away with it. McPhee would then try and move into the lucrative drugs game. The following year, in 1991, he was an alleged gun for hire in notorious murders of Bobby Glover and Joe Bananas Hanlon. Frank's name had been linked to both men's murders simply because he was one of only a few in Glasgow at the time capable of carrying out such murders. I will leave you to make your own assumptions about that particular story and its links to Frank McPhee. He was known to work with Arthur Thompson and they had apparently worked with the same paramilitary connections in Ireland as well as the Blue Angels motorcycle gang who had links to James Kingy King who ran guns for Thompson. McPhee and King's name were thrown into the mix by the press at the time me personally, I think it's a bit of a myth, even though Frank was more than capable of committing the murders. In 1992, McPhee and James King were sentenced to eight years in jail for their part in a busted drug deal 
with a Newcastle based firm at Frank's Dog Kennels. The cash had been put up by Arthur Thompson. The Geordies were dropping off £29,000 worth of cannabis resin and it was cash up front. Who knows if the police had been tipped off or maybe the Geordies had been tailed to Glasgow from Tyneside. Either way, the hash would have netted McPhee and King 200 grand in the streets of Glasgow sold. McPhee was sent to Berlinie at first, then on to HMP Perth to serve his sentence. When Frank landed in HMP Perth's A-hole, he immediately started trying to control the drugs, just like he'd done previously while well locked up in Peterhead. But someone was already doing this. A nutcase from Claybank called William Worm Toy. Toy was controlling D Hall's drugs, and when he got moved to A Hall in 1997, it was inevitable the two hard men would have to go against each other. Toy's family were well known in Claybank, and William was in jail for murdering Edward Maxwell, who was going to court as a witness against his brother Gavin Toy for killing another gangland rival of theirs, John McRae. Gavin Toy was still convicted of murdering John McRae. So William Toy had basically murdered Maxwell for nothing. Apparently the tension started almost instantly with Toy trying to dig out whoever it was in control and of course, McPhee declared it was him. Apparently Toy had invited McPhee and another man to his cell to talk about it. McPhee cautiously agreed but didn't trust Toy. After all, he was in for a brutal murder. So McPhee would have taken it's a not kill actually to known what was said or happened in Toy's cell between him and Frank McPhee that day. But by the time the meeting was over, William Toy had been stabbed through the heart and died before they could get him to a hospital. The last people in his cell are seen near Toy was allegedly Frank McPhee and another man named Neil Monroe, who was supposed to be a peacekeeper between the two men, but Monroe was on McPhee's side. Both McPhee and Monroe were charged with William Toy's murder, but the alleged witness refused to say that Frank McPhee and Neil Monroe were the last people he had seen leaving Toy's cell as he approached to have a cup of tea, earlier arranged by himself and Toy. So the verdict was ruled not proven, and Frank McPhee and Neil Monroe walked in the murder charge at Perth Sheriff Court. When Frank was released from Perth prison, his notorious reputation had grown even more. After all, he had just walked on a prison murder. Some say he thought he was invincible. While he was in prison, his friend from Balamut, Colin Mackay, befriended a man called Christopher McGrory. McGrory from Lennoxtown allegedly had money, so Frank convinced Mackay to get McGrory involved in drug dealing as a financial backer. McGrory agreed. He had visited Frank up in Perth, along with Colin Mackay, but Mackay and McGrory were already dabbling in the sale of cocaine, and Frank wanted a piece of the action now he was out. Truth be told, Mackay and McGrory were good friends, but that changed when Frank got involved. Mackay was too busy trying to please Frank and was becoming increasingly more distant to McGrory. Even so, McGrory still made Mackay his best man at his wedding and Frank his usher. It was at McGrory's wedding over in Ireland that they made a connection through a mutual friend of McGrory's. Christopher drugs. McGrory had gotten over his head. He just couldn't handle Frank's short temper and his level of violence and called Mackay's willingness to participate in this violence along with him. McGrory was becoming uncomfortable so he had already told his wife he planned to do his own thing after this deal was done. The coke was coming from one of Frank's Irish contacts that he had made at McGrory's wedding. Two kilos of it. But when Frank went to pick up, there was only one kilo there. So Frank and Colin said to McGrory. But Frank underestimated Christopher McGrory. McGrory had phoned the Irish contact because McPhee was trying to make him pay for the kilo even though it was missing. And McGrory had told the Irish mob he suspected that Frank had took it. Either way, the drugs had to be paid for. The Irish drug dealers had then phoned up McPhee, then told him about Christopher McGrory's phone call to them, claiming that Frank had stole the kilo. It's not known where the kilo of cocaine went or who took it, but the Irish mob didn't care. They apparently told Frank to deal with it or they would send two people over that would. The last time Christopher McGrory was seen alive, he was being led into the back of his own white transit van by two men at Lamhill Stables. He was found dead in the back of his van just outside Douglaston Golf Club, Mulgai, on a secluded road. He had been strangled to death by someone's bare hands. McGrory's best man and his usher at his wedding, literally a few months prior, were both charged with his murder. After the trial at the High Court in Glasgow, the jury re returned yet another not proven verdict for Frank McPhee and now Mackay. Apparently a crowd cheered in the gallery 
after the verdict was read out. Frank was now 50 years old, and after yet another not proven for a second murder in the space of two years, Frank really was on another level. He was always dangerous, yes, one of the most dangerous men in Glasgow. Or a vicious bully, depending on who you spoke to, but this was different. He was taking on all comers, including the Daniel and Lang's families, for control of the drug trade in the north of the city. He allegedly slashed one of the family's younger members across the face, just to prove a point. Then after it, took himself round to the corner from his house on Guthrie Street to the family's Lockburn Road scrapyard, as if to say, if anyone wants to do anything about it, well here I am. The cocaine in the deal with the Irish still hadn't been paid for, and Frank also allegedly gave someone a real tanking outside a pub to do with another local hardman and Daniel Heavy, John McCabe. In April 2000, Frank was issued with a threat to life warning by the CID. The two offers delivering it to him at his ground floor flat in Guthrie Street, Mary Hill, recalled McFee's attitude towards them and the warning itself. He treated it with a carefree attitude and was more bothered about them coming to his door, annoying him with empty threats from so-called police intelligence about a contract being taken out on his life. If Frank was worried, he certainly didn't show it. The following month, on May 10th, Frank woke up and went about his daily business as normal. He jumped in his van and went to meet a friend up Poso. While he was there, he realised a blue car was following him. A high-speed chase through Glasgow developed. Frank had managed to evade the car chasing him, and as he got back to his house, he stepped out of his van and paused for a brief few seconds to look around for the car that had been chasing him. As he did this, Frank was hit and killed by a single shot to the head from a sniper's rifle from the drying area of the high-rise flats across the street from his house. This was no run of the mill shooting. This was a professional contract killing. Frank was considered so dangerous at the time, whoever did this had to make sure it was done right, because Frank would no doubt be back for revenge. Frank died in the street while being cradled by his 11-year-old son, Frank Jr. John McCabe was charged with Frank McPhee's murder. The Clark brothers, who were friendly with McPhee, were also questioned over his killing, but the murder charge against McCabe was ultimately dropped through lack of evidence. John McCabe was a serious player and hard man, but the shooting with a sniper rifle was considered out of his depth. John was an easy option for the cops, as he only stayed about 200 yards away from Frank and had run-ins with him, along with most of the other known faces in Glasgow. So who killed Frank McPhee? A gangster so dangerous it had to be done with a telescopic rifle from 100 yards away. Was it Irish paramilitaries? One of Glasgow's two big families he had upset? The failure to pay back Christopher McGrory's Irish cocaine connection that went wrong? Relatives of McGrory? Who knows? But someone wanted him dead and got their wish. Frank McPhee's murder is still unsolved. <laughs>